Welcome everyone and welcome to our online audience too, to the first do-it-yourself synth building project and workshop. I guess um, we never, when we came up with this idea, and mo most of you might have have seen uh, might have seen the introduction we did during circuits. Um, we never expected. We never expected this response from the public. We wanted to try an experiment, um, and I can truly say that we are really, really swept away. And here, um, I, in name of EMM, I would like to thank um, everyone for the response. Uh, all the all the first owners, um, I'm already called them Storbusy, <laughs> the owners of Storbu. Um, just to put everything in in concept and and in, pro, uh, in con our concept is that this is a very simple device it's very uh, um it's very hard to let's say get something wrong in it although there are two slightly small components and it's made with very uh, i would say n not expensive um components too but the output is quite interesting um uh, how the structure of Today's workshop, which will be about 90 minutes, um, I will, I will obvi obviously pass over the, the um, I would say, the microphone to, to my colleagues um, Frank, and Mike, whom obviously I would still again like to thank for their, for their effort in designing and in, in producing this device for us. So on to you, uh, Frank and Mike, for for this workshop. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Frank. This is Mike. <laughs> and we're going to give you a run through how to, how to assemble this, uh, this PCB with the components and, with, and, and also a slight idea how to, how to use the soldering iron how to determine the components and how to how to uh, how to read the values and uh, and whatever you know all you need to know the basic stuff to, to build this store view unit yes exactly um, we are not aiming to make professors out of you but uh, we will be giving you some uh, very basic details on uh, electronics, uh, how to solder. Frankie will be uh, commencing the assembly of uh, an actual unit so that you can follow him. And as he goes along, I will uh, put forward some theory, basic theory about um, the, the different components, electronic components involved. It's very interesting. And uh, maybe if the time would allow us, uh, we would go over to um, uh, how, the, how, how it works and uh, the principles by which uh, some synthesis uh, can be uh, done. Um, now, now uh, Frankie will give us a demonstration, a basic demonstration on how to solder. Uh, it's like riding a bike. Uh, it's a bit difficult at first, but once you get the skill, you're, 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 you can go. Basically, you, frankly, so. for all the beginners, like the tools, you can see I have a very simple setup. So all you need is like a soldering iron, which we advise that it will be like not more than 25 watts soldering iron. Most of the soldering irons on the benches are regulated. Over here I have a very simple one which can do the job also. Uh, just a miniature side cutter to cut the tails of the components and just some solder. So basically we don't need much. I like to keep a piece of sponge to, to hold the components on, onto the board, but that's, anyone can use a vise if they're equipped with a vise. But if you're at home and you don't have any vise or something, I just use the sponge to keep the components pressed and I will turn the board and solder from the other side. So you can also solder from the side of the components. I prefer to solder from the other side, from the back end of the components. 
And basically what, what, what I will do, I will have a look at the components and I always start with the smaller components first. Since I'm using the technique with the sponge, you cannot start with the bigger components because then you cannot keep the, the smaller components in place. So in our case, we have the diodes here, a set of 13 diodes, which we're using for this unit. And I will start with the diodes and diodes, Mike will explain, they are polarized components. So they have to be placed on the board in, a, in, a, in the proper way, you know? They, they have the anode and the cutout, so you, you cannot put them just like a resistor, which is not polarized. You have to make sure that they are in the right direction. Frank, if so I I'm may, gonna um, start. Frank, if I may, the, the, the diode, because it's the smallest component, maybe you can hold it a bit straight yeah, in front yeah, of yeah. that camera. This is um, on the side. I don't, I don't it's, the, it's a very small component. Um, Sam, is, Sam is doing making a signal to you. Yes. Yes. It's the smallest. It's it's, small. It looks like it's a small insect, actually. So and the side, the, it's got a small dot, a black I dot. On I it, will on the keep side. it between my fingers I, and I will bend the, the legs. Then also we have the BOM to follow. So the, the bill of material will explain where to put your, the components on the board. So since I am starting with the diode, the diodes are marked at, on the second page, bot bottom second page. And there we can find that the type of the diode, it's the 1N4148. And then on the board, all the diodes we have, basically they are all the same kind of diode. So I will start placing the diode in place, one after the other. And then I will show you. So, so to make it simple for you, I will I put the diodes one diode in, in its place. Normally I will put the sponge, I will turn the board upside down and I will solder just by cleaning the tip of the soldering iron, heating a bit the, the leg, then I put a little bit of tin uh, of solder. And that I have the first diode in place and I can then cut the legs with the side cutter. <coughs> I will continue with all the diodes. In the meantime, maybe Mike can give a run through the components and other interesting. Yeah, sure. So, uh -huh. If you follow the BOM, yes, let, let me explain a bit. So the diodes, the 1N4148, next, next to the diode, you can see D1, D2, D3, D4. They are all marked, those numbers, they are all marked on the board itself. So where you find D1, you have to place a diode. Then when you As, as I told you, the diodes are polarized. So, if you take a closer look at the diode, you will see that it's like a reddish, it's a piece of glass with a reddish core, and on one side you have a black ring. That, bla that black ring has to match the mark on the, on the, on the PCB itself. There is a mark on one side of the, of the PCB, like a line. 
and the black ring has to match, has to be on the side of that line. Um, if I may, um, Frankie, who designed this uh, printed circuit, made it easier because uh, they are all uh, aligned uh, in one direction. And uh, as Frankie was saying, where the black ring is on the glass encapsulation of the diode, that should be facing downwards. So if this is the PCB, you will note that all positions of the diodes, which are here, they are all facing downwards. Uh, Frankie, you have uh, more, or perhaps I can commence? Uh, you can commence. On with the, in right. the meantime, I will be assembling all the diodes. Yes, OK, of course. Um, this will be a general walkthrough uh, to electronics and some basic theory so that you, everybody can appreciate um, what goes down. Now, uh, are there by any chance any electronic engineers here or, or who knows about electronics uh, so that I can set the level by which I start? No. All right. OK. Um, electronics basically is the control of, electro of the flow of electrons. And the way that it is done, uh, there are several different components by which they do separate functions. And when you put them together in a particular combination, uh, they you would achieve the kind of control you want. And uh, the most basic of the control components is the resistor. What is a resistor? A resistor is a resistor is simply, as the name implies, an object which offers resistance to the flow of electrons. Um, there are several values of resistors. One would argue it would it is arguably the most common type of component you can find uh, on any printed circuit or any, any circuit. And uh, there is a large number of values. There is a standard table for it, more than one, so that uh, you can have a rational number of resistances value so that uh, it would simplify assembly. Uh, since this was, since this is, um, uh, an international thing, um, the standard way of indicating the resistance values is through using color rings. Um, it is not the scope of the this discussion here that uh, we go into that. The, the internet is uh, your friend here. By all means, go and look at it. Uh, however, in our case, if we look at the BOM of the store view, uh, you will note that next to the values of the resistors, there are four boxes with four colors indicated in them. Um, up to this level, if you follow the colors, for example, if we look at the first resistor in uh, the store view BOM, it's one kilo ohm, whose coloring is brown, black, red, and gold. So if we find the resistors which are brown, black, and gold, we would have found those particular resistors. Now, the BOM is your friend here in that in order to avoid confusion, if you look at the number, okay, okay, okay. if you look at those numbers in that uh, grid of boxes which you have next to the value, you would see in this case R1, R2, R4, R5, and those references refer to the particular 
locations on the board. Now, if we, if we, if we, okay, <laughs> okay. Now, um, if we look, for example, which resistor this one is, it is R29. So R29, we find R29, we see that it is a 3.3 kilo ohm resistor, which is orange, orange, red, gold. We would find the orange, orange, red, gold, and we can put it in its place. Apart from fixed resistors, which offer, obviously, as the name implies, resistance to the electron flow, uh, there are also other kinds of resistors which change their value. It is like when you go to fill a glass with water. If the valve is closed, there is no water coming out. When you open it and leave it at a setting, you would get so much water. If you reduce or increase the valve opening, the amount of water flow would change accordingly. In this case, Instead of water, we have electrons, but basically, that is exactly what is happening. Now, uh, Storbu, apart from fixed resistors, use two other types of resistors. One of them is a variable resistor, and the other one is a light-dependent resistor, which we will come to presently. Let us consider the variable resistor, or as it is known more commonly as a potentiometer. What is this potentiometer? Uh, as I have said before, um, if you want to fill a glass with water and the rate by which you want to open it, you adjust the water faucet. So here we have a potentiometer which has a knob, uh, a shaft here, which can be rotated. If we look closely at the connections, there are three of them. These represent the two at the ends. They are like the leads on the resistor from here to here. So the value, the resistive value of the potentiometer across the end connectors is always its value. The value of the potentiometers, of which we have two different values on this one, one is 100 kilo ohms, and the other six are 500 kilo ohms. When we take a look at the center one, the center one is connected to a wiper or contact, which when we rotate the shaft, will change direction from one side to the other. This would have the result that if we measure the resistance from either one of the end connectors, to the center one, the resistance would vary accordingly as the shaft is rotated. So if we are measuring from the right-hand side, from my side, to the center, and the shaft is rotated all the way to here, we would have the minimum resistance. When we rotate it at about halfway, we would have half the resistance of the potentiometer, and when we go on the other side, we would get the full resistance. Now, what is the use of this? Again, I go back to the metaphor of filling a glass of water. If you want to fill the glass slowly, you just open it a little bit and the water drips down. If you want to fill it fast, you open it all the way. It is the same thing again, except, except with water, 
In this case, we are talking about electrons along a wire. The other type of resistor which we have on the store view is the light dependent resistor. And as the name implies, um, uh, its resistance depends upon the amount of light which falls upon it. This is used in the store view so that rather than we just rotate a shaft to change the frequency of the oscillators, we can use our hand to shield the LDR, which is situated on the PCB from the light, and we would change its frequency. This would give us an effect similar but slightly different from the theremin, which uses uh, capacitive differences between uh, hands and its antennae. Uh, rather, here we are using the, the amount of light falling down. And that's basically the different types of resistors we have in this project. Since these resistors, they just offer resistance to electron flow, they can be placed onto the printed circuit in any way. It is common practice, and it is also good practice, that they are inserted with the colors always facing in the same direction. Uh, electrically, it would make no difference, but uh, it would give a neater appearance to the project. Next component type we have is the diode, which Frankie has mentioned. This diode can be compared to as being as a one-way valve. A one-way valve is when you have This is a, a, a pipe through which water flows. When we have a resistance, there is resistance here. So here, this would cause the electrons, water in this case, to slow down because there is a resistance here. If instead of resistance, which makes no difference whether the current flow is in this direction or this direction, if we put a valve here, if water tries to pass in this direction, it would open and water would pass through. However, if the water would attempt to pass back here, it would close the valve and the water would stop. Same thing with the diode. If we have a diode, and this is the electrical symbol of a diode, if electrons try to pass from here to here, they would find very little resistance. However, if they try to go back, they would find a very high resistance, and they would not be able to go through. Since this diode has direction in which it has to work, this cannot be placed casually on the circuit, but the way it is fitted, this way or this way, would have to be uh, compared to and followed as indicated, as we already said, 
on the circuit. And that's another type of diode. Uh, this diode, particular diode, is the IEN4148. Uh, it is a general purpose diode. Uh, it is made out of glass. And if we look on the way that you can check on the polarity, If the circuit shows the diode like this, this diode has a black ring to one side. That ring coincides to this direction, so current flow would flow here. Right. Another type of diode, which is used here, is the light emitting diode. This particular diode uses what is called a junction inside it, which when current passes through it, it excites the materials in it, which is basically gallium, arsenic, and other exotic metals, to excite the atoms which make them up. And these atoms emit photons, which our eyes interpret as particular colors. I am sure that everybody is familiar with an LED. Everybody has seen an LED. We are surrounded by LEDs. But this particular LED true to the spirit of this torbule, which is very, not unreliable, but, but it is reliable, but, but it's very uh, unpredictive and, and it can give very surprising surpri um, effects. This particular diode does not have just one color. Uh, it has uh, Actually, inside it, there are three separate LEDs. They are red, green, and blue. There is also a control circuit inside it, which when we power it up, it would change the amount of each LED, and we would have an effect, a rainbow effect of colors changing from one side to, to, to the other. Since this is a diode, this also needs to be inserted properly. If it is inserted the other way around, there is no big deal, no problem. It simply would not work. If it is put the right way around, it would light up with its first color and cycle through the colors. This is what we call an active component, rather to the passive component, which is the resistor. Another type of passive component is what is called the capacitor. The resistor offers resistance to electric, electronic electron flow. Capacitors are like a reservoir, like the car, you have the fuel tank, there's fuel in a tank. The capacitor is something similar to that. And uh, we find that if we apply a voltage across the capacitor, it would store the voltage as a charge and retain it for some time. This is very useful in electronics in that it can be used at the rate it absorbs uh, charge and retains it and how much. 
to be used for producing oscillations all the way up to trying to reduce interference on the circuit. In our case here, the capacitors that we use are applied for those two principles in that some capacitors are used to generate the sound, whereas the other capacitors are used to provide the oscillators with a smooth and a clean power supply. The capacitors which produce the sound need to be very small so that the frequency at which they charge and discharge could be raised to audio levels and we can hear it. Contrary to this, the power smoothing capacitors need to be somewhat bigger in value and we have what is called the electrolytic capacitor. Suffice it to say that this electrolytic capacitor has more value, it is like a much more bigger tank, depending on the value. Now, the small capacitors, which in my hand are ceramic capacitors, they are like resistors, they do not have any polarity, and they can be fitted the other way around without any problem. Contrary to this, the electrolytic capacitor is like a diode and it has polarity. This polarity is indicated on the case by a white bar closest to the negative lead. Apart from this white bar, there is also the sign of negative minus on the white bar. And if you look at the leads, you will notice that one is longer than the other. The longer one is the positive, and the short one is the negative. This reminds me that on the LED, since we need to know on which side it is, this indication is also placed in the LED design, where we find that we have a short lead and a long lead. Always, the long lead goes towards the positive side of the circuit. In your case of the printed circuit of Storbio, we have an, a, a different indication in that there is a flat side of a circle for D14, and that is the negative side, which is the shorter side of this. Another type of, okay, so any questions so far? Everybody's busy? No questions? Good. I'm that good, huh? Okay. Right. Another type, and this is where it gets interesting, of component is what is called the transistor. How to describe a transistor? Well, I would say it is like the power-assisted steering of a car. You just touch the wheel, and that very small mechanical effort is translated by mechanical amplifiers into a larger force to the wheels, so that with the minimum of effort, the wheels would turn 
and the car would go in the direction you want it to be, hopefully. I remember the old cars, you had to, uh, you know, but today, no, you can steer them with your finger. This principle applies also to the transistor. How? The transistor has three leads. One, two, and three. And we can draw these three leads. Thus, we have This is the transistor. Now, this is a resistor to control because this cannot accept infinite current. If we try to connect it directly across the supply, we would be basically killing it because it would overload immediately and burn out. But if we put a resistor to reduce the load... May I say, uh, yes, sorry, yes, sure. uh, just for those who are following the bill of materials, I would like to point out that uh, R28 and R33, 2.2 mega ohms, the color coding has to be amended. So it would be red, red and green, not, not brown, black and green. So, because you might not find them in your packets, so that should read red, red, green, and gold, obviously. R28 and R33. Okay. Yes, you can continue, Mike, sorry. So, uh, the way the transistor works. The, the transistor works that if we give it a small amount of electrons in here, it is able to pass a larger number of electrons. Without going into details, this is the basic way it functions. It's not that simple, obviously, but if we, here we see that we have what is called amplification. Amplification means that you give a very small input and you get a larger output for, for it. And that is basically how a transistor works. A transistor is very small. It, uh, Probably nobody remembers the term ionic valves. I do. <laughs> I used to remember the televisions which we hang today on the walls. They used to be part of the furniture about half the size of this table with a very deep glass tube. It's like an aquarium. And if you looked into it, it looks like something from science fiction movie with uh, eerie and almost evil looking red glowing glass tubes in them, you know. When I was young, I used to imagine a voice coming from them, you know, like take me to your leader, something like that. Uh, I, I, I am blessed with a very fertile imagination. Anyway, <laughs> um, fortunately, for those who are afraid of such things, the transistor came along and these tiny things replaced those uh, vacuum flasks and they do the same functions, basically. However, this is not the end of the story for the evolution from thermionic valves to semiconductor transistors. And somebody got the idea of rather than producing just a single transistor, they said, 
why don't we get a lot of these and put them all together in a case? And we see what happens. And what happened was that nowadays we have what we call integrated circuits, which consist of a number of transistors connected in a particular circuit design with the other resistors, diodes, capacitors, you name it, into a very small enclosure, which produce a particular function. And that opened the way to further miniaturization. And here we have one such integrated circuit, which consists of a very good number of transistors, capacitors, resistors, and what you have. This has revolutionized the electronic industry, but it has also revolutionized the do-it-yourself part of the electronics in that where you had to have a very big printed circuit full of transistors and resistors and capacitors, you have the basic design already built into this little weird DNA here. We have here, it's a bug, basically, that's Maltese for uh, cockroach. And uh, all we have to do is to feed it the right voltages, give it the right signals, set the conditions, and it provides us with what we want. This particular integrated circuit, which is used in the Storbio project, was not designed particularly to produce music. In fact, I would imagine that its um, designers had music very far from their mind where they designed it because originally it is uh, officially a digital integrated circuit, which means that it works with either ones or zeros, high or low voltages, and it's normally used to clean up inputs before they are given into the circuits behind it so that they can be processed. However, the way it works, the principle lends itself very easily to produce an oscillator. We will see what that is in a minute. And we can make the oscillator to function in the audible range. So we have an integrated circuit with the surrounding components to produce Storbio. There are also switch, switch is a switch, it, I, it is like a, an interrupter. When it, is, when it makes contact, you have current flow. When you don't have contact, there is no current flow. So if we draw the circuit of a switch, we have a switch which is open, so no current flow. If we close the switch, we have current flow. It becomes ideally like a piece of wire. This particular switch which we are using now is slightly more than that. This switch is what is called a changeover switch, in that it is not simply on and off. Actually, it does not have on and off, but it has either this configuration or else this configuration. This enables us to route what is going in here 
to either here or if we change it over to here, you would have things coming over here. In this particular build, this switching action is used so that we can select the frequency control of the project either from a potentiometer or else to the light dependent resistor. Apart from these components, we have sockets so that we can connect the circuit to the real world. We can give it power and we can take what is produced sound in this case into amplifiers so that we can hear it. Right. Questions? Okay. Frank, you would like to... So I will okay, explain well. a bit what I've done so far. So after soldering all the diodes to the PCB, the next component I went to was the resistor, the fixed resistor. So because in size, it is a little bit bigger than the, than the diodes. And as you can see right now, I have all the diodes which are in place. And now I also have all, all the fixed resistors also in place. The next component I will go for right now is the capacitors, which uh, Mike have already explained about. The capacitors are these components here. They are slightly bigger and higher in the, in, in, uh, than the resistors. So I will place them on the PCB and start soldering them. As Mike also said, these type of capacitors do not have any polarity. But then we have the electrolytic capacitor, which is over here. This is a polarized capacitor. So that we have to take care of the polarity, which is also marked on the PCB with a plus sign. So basically, when we Frankie, come to that... Frankie, Frankie, um, maybe it's good to note that the ceramic capacitors can be identified. There's a very small number, if you have a lens, ideally, yes. when assembling these, um, these type of circuits, if you have like one of those lenses, you can look. And there's a very, very small number that indicates the, the capacitance. Um, basically, just yes, just, and uh, just maybe Mike can minutes. also explain how to identify because we have, I think, four various values of capacitors in the circuit. Yes. So while I'm soldering them, Mike can explain maybe the values how to, how to right, right. Um, without having a meter, obviously. Yes, of course. Um, obviously, I'm going to stick to the values which are to be used here. As Frankie says, if you have a good look at the capacitors themselves, you will notice a three-digit number. Okay? That is the, the capacitance equivalent of the color bending to, for used for identification for resistors. Capacitors use a number. And the number works out to the value. And the last number is the number of zeros behind the value which is noted down there. In this case, there is no need to go any deeper into that. But if you match the number of the capacitors you have in hand to the number which is shown on the BOM, you would be identifying the correct capacitor which goes 
into its particular place on the board. Now, I have three capacitors in my hand. The number is, if I am not wrong, 104, I think, or 105. I would say this is 105. When we look at the BOM, the capacitor which has the value 105 and is yellow-orange, I call that tweety yellow, need to go into locations C4, C5, C6. So the 105s would go into C4, C5, and C6. The same applies to the other capacitors, except for the electrolytic one, which conveniently has its value noted down the way us humans write numbers and here you have 10 microfarads written down on the can itself. Okay? Any questions? Right. That covers component identification and some appreciation on what they do so that together they can produce some store view. Now, before we change over to some basic theory on how store view works, I think uh, we need to mention that there are several safety issues involved when one is using a soldering iron to solder electronic components. The most obvious safety issue would be literally at hand in that uh, a soldering iron is used to melt the solder which melts at high temperatures, which if they come in contact with your hand or whatever, they can cause harm. So always be careful and follow the instructions when using a soldering iron. One other less obvious but just as important safety factor which has to be taken into consideration when soldering components is that you must not breathe in any of the fumes which are produced with the soldering process. While solder itself is a mixture, an alloy of metal, mostly lead, now there is lead-free solder, but there is still lead solder in use and tin. But if we, take, if we really look at a piece of soldering wire under, uh, say, a microscope, we would find that it has a core which is not made out of metal. That core contains what is called flux, and the purpose of the flux is to clean away any material contamination which is on the surface of the wire so that the solder would be able to act on the metal itself. It is important not to breathe those fumes and therefore one has to work in a very well ventilated area. 
obviously here we are in a period of extraordinary safety measures to COVID-19. Who hasn't heard about that? Huh? So always remember to keep your distance where we are working together. Also, unless one is intended to start a career in electronics or take it at least to the next level, on the hobby level, there are very basic tools which are required to actually build Storeview. In fact, just a soldering iron and a side cutter would be enough for the project to be finished satisfactorily. However, if one wants or feels that he would like to take the hobby further, he would need some more, more equipment, but basically that would be like a long nose plier used to bend wires, uh, a stand for the PCB so that it can be held up like this and the person can work upon it. Then there are test equipment which are multimeters. This multimeter is very useful in that it can monitor the voltage levels, the current going through the wires so that one can see that the circuit that he has built is behaving accordingly. If we, one would go up another level, uh, you can actually, rather than just see, read the voltage which is going on, you can actually see the, how the electrons are flowing through the wires by using what is called an oscilloscope, which basically demonstrates the waveforms which are passing through the conductors in the separate parts of the circuit. And then obviously there are uh, other more sophisticated tools, but uh, then we would start to leave the hobbyist level and start going into the professional level uh, because the, the price would go up and, and uh, you know, it depends on how much you want to be involved into the hobby. Right. Okay. Um, I guess we can... Any questions? Any questions? Yes. No? No questions? Good. I'm a good teacher. Okay. How can you remove back the storage? Um, okay, yes. That's a, that's a very valid... Um, uh, question. Uh, a soldering iron is used to apply solder. When I started soldering, originally it was like, whoa, go into it and you end up with a mound of solder on each connection and uh, the teacher used to frown at me and, uh, okay, one mark less. So I would have to use what is called a desoldering tool. The desoldering tool does the exact opposite of a soldering tool. In that, it removes solder from the joint. And how does it do it? There are several ways of doing it. One way is by using what is called the soldering braid. This is just wire which is flat. It is made up in a way that when it is applied to hot solder which is molten, this is um, sucked up, shall we say, by capillary action into the braid weave and it migrates, the solder migrates from the joint up to the braid which is then removed, snipped off and thrown away. A more effective way is to use a desoldering tool, an actual desoldering tool or as it is known by the, its other name, a solder sucker, which describes aptly what it does because it is, in effect, a syringe 
but used in the opposite way. A yeah, syringe is used it right now. to be given, to, to administer doses of medicine or chemicals or whatever, but the desoldering tool, rather than delivering, takes away the solder from the joint. And the way it does this is that it is spring-loaded, and when you heat the joint, okay, here we have one. This is a soldering, a desoldering tool. This is the tip which is applied to the solder joint. And this is the plunger, which is spring-loaded. And when we release it, it causes a vacuum here, and it pulls up the solder from the joint. So the way to operate it is load it up, apply it to the joint where you want to remove the excess solder, you heat the solder with the soldering iron until it melts, press the trigger button here, watch what happens here, that goes up, temporary vacuum, and the molten solder goes up in here. That is basically how it works. Mike, we have a question yes. from our online um, attendees, and I'd like to obviously to say hi to them um, too. Basically, uh, they would like a reminder about the orientation of the diodes, please. Okay. Diodes. If one looks at the actual diode, this is the diode. Okay? I'm going to keep this to the diode we have in hand, but it applies generally for all diodes. All diodes have a way of showing their orientation. And normally, this can take the form of a dot, a line, or else the whole side of it, which is the case we have here, And that sign means that the actual diode, which is this, has to be orientated the way it is shown in the circuit with this theoretical symbol. Always keep in mind that the polarity mark is always on this bar here. Okay? And that basically is the thing to remember when one is using diodes. By the way, uh, this is a glass diode, so the mark is black, but there are also black diodes and the mark is white. Mentioning polarity, one thing which I, am, which I have forgotten to mention, these integrated circuits, I will draw a four-legged one, also have polarity. And it is of the utmost importance that this is observed. This polarity is indicated with something similar to the diodes, with either a dot or else an indentation, 
or else a bar like this. There is also, now it is coming also, but it's a different technology. It's used rather for SMDs that when you look at it up front, these are the feet, okay? This side would be slanted. It would be like this. So in this case, it would be like this. Therefore, the pin, the topmost pin, when we uh, look at the integrated circuit with this slanted side to the left, or the dot on top, or the indentation, this pin is invariably pin 1. Obviously, the one next to it is pin 2. Pin 3 and pin 4. It is the convention that pin 5 continues in the same direction. So we find that pin 1 here, 1, 2, 3, 4, pin 5 is this. Pin 6, pin 7, pin 8. This is a 14 pin case. So we have the mark here. It has something similar to this. Therefore, pin 1 is here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, pin 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There are bigger packages, and now a days there are more than one type of package. One particular package is squarish with lots of leads, but that goes beyond the scope of our discussion today. Any more questions on the packaging, orientation, techniques? No, good. Right. Okay. If he had the board, we shall do no see. Okay. Yes, Frankie is reminding me. Um, similar to the integrated circuit, when we look at the transistor, this is going a little bit uh, deeper, but no problem. It's good to know. There are basically two general types of transistors. They are what is called the NPN and the PNP. Uh, and to keep it short, uh, it depends on the way that they are connected in relation to the power supply. PNP transistors, uh, PNP means negative, positive, negative, PNP, positive, negative, Positive, um, these are denoted, when you look at a circuit, a theoretical circuit, you would note that the transistors have either an arrow pointing downwards, or else an arrow pointing upwards. This is the NPN transistor, and this is the PNP. In our case, we are using the more common NPN transistor, and the leads 
needs to be identified because it can, uh, there is a middle one, but uh, this way or this way. So the leads are identified by being called the collector, base, and emitter. Now, um, this particular transistor, I am not sure which one is the collector, the base, and the emitter. However, Frankie has taken care of that when he designed the printed circuit in that you have the silhouette of the transistors, which are Q1 and Q2. Q1 and Q2, which you will note, they have, it is like this, which is the same shape as the transistor. So, without having to look up which one is the base, it, it, it's basically most of the time is the center one, but which one is the collector, which one is the emitter. In this case, you do not need to do, so, to do that. All you have to do is to be sure that you insert it the same way it is drawn, and you are good to go. Just to be safe, when you insert the center one, the center conductor, do not insert it, do not insert it into the middle one between the two at the end. Insert it in the one which is on the periphery of the drawing. That would prevent you from shorting inadvertently the contacts between each other when you are soldering them. Okay. Now, a quick look at what we have here. Storbu, when it is functioning, has six oscillators. An oscillator is an electronic building block which produces noise. Noise, a frequency. The frequency depends on the capacitor and the setting of the potentiometer. This represents an oscillator with an output and frequency control. Three of the oscillators can produce outputs in the audible range. The other three can produce oscillations in a lower band, which goes much lower than the audible range. This is done so that the output of these last three oscillators can be used to modulate the frequency of the first three oscillators to produce more effects, frequency effects. There are the possibility, there is the possibility to connect up to two low frequency oscillators into the normal oscillator so that you can have a cumulative effect which is much more interesting than having just one. That is one oscillator, and here we have six, hence six controls. Apart from that, there is what is called a mixer, where we can collect any output 
from these six. Here, there are two separate output stages, which after they mix the separate inputs, they amplify it a bit, and the result can be output into a separate amplifier so that it can be heard through the speakers. There is also what is called a multiple connector, which is simply you, it is like an extension. Like this, you have one source of current going in, but you can connect it in this case to four separate outputs. In our case, we have four of three inputs, one input and two outputs, multiple, multiples, it's called multiples. These are called resources. By themselves, they don't do much. However, we can connect them accordingly to our wishes. So for example, if we would like to hear an oscillator working, what we do is we connect its output to one input of the mixer, and what happens here is produced in the output to the speaker. If we want to modulate an oscillator, we take the output of a low frequency oscillator, feed it into either A or B, and it would affect the frequency of the oscillator. This is done in the top part of the PCB, where we have the six oscillators with their controls here, with their outputs here, which can be connected either to the mixer inputs here, and we have two outputs here. If we want to modulate the first three oscillators, we can take an output from, say, output oscillator six, and we feed it back either in modulation input A or modulation input B. If we want one output to modulate more than one oscillator, we connect the output to a multiple, and we have two similar outputs which we can connect to either AB of any oscillator. This has been uh, put into the design of the Storbio noise monger because it introduces the Storbiuisti, was, that, was it the word? The people who makes noise with this, to the basic principles used to generate sound by synthesizers, uh, which is called patching. This, uh, if any one of you remember the old style telephone exchanges, you take one output, you put it into the input, and uh, you can program these resources into any way you want. As I have stated before, if we look at the printed circuit, as I have said, we have six oscillators, their frequency controls, individual frequency controls, are over here, six potentiometers, and we have a global control, frequency control over here. Apart from a potentiometer giving our global control on the oscillator, if we change over to the light-dependent resistor, 
we can control all oscillators at once without actually touching anything but controlling the light from the light dependent resistor which would have the same effect as rotating the shaft of the potentiometer which would eventually lead to changing its frequency. Uh, basically, that is it. <laughs> it's, it has to be somewhat, it has to be somewhat short and to the point. However, if you look and run searches on the internet, you would be, you would find a wealth of uh, information on the subject. The most popular format currently in the world of synthesis is what is called the Eurorec format. This was invented by a certain Dofer, a German person, who took what is called the large format uh, modules, like the Moog and the Korg synthesizers, modular synthesizers, and he converted it into a more economical uh, format which made the modules which are which have particular functions but they all work together with the same thing through patching uh, to produce a particular sound um, more accessible to others apart from that um, uh, a lot of people have taken up to designing their own modules with their own ideas on how to produce sounds. Now we have the East Coast type of sound generation. We have the West Coast type of sound generation. But all this, we all have to say thank you mostly to Dr. Robert Moog who came up with the idea that he uses what basically were test equipment and analog computers as opposed to the digital computers which we are used to today to produce sound. Since he wanted to try to make the idea available to the most number of people, he decided to cast this new technology, it wasn't new, the, the idea, to the musical scene. So he had to represent the idea of generating music, which was not a new idea. In fact, uh, it was apparently the English Came, came up with the idea, and we have like uh, Derbyshire of the British uh, BBC radio workshop, and they came up, for example, with the famous uh, Doctor Who team, and he came up with the idea of uh, bridging the gap between music and electronics in his own way, to come up with the modular synthesizer principle. So I would like to first of all thank you, Mike, for for this, this and Frankie for this um, presentation. Well done. Um, so far, and I'm checking one final time. We thank also the online participants on Zoom, but there were no just that one question. Um, I will be ending the Zoom soon, basically to all who are attending both virtually and, and physically here, whom I thank again, once again. 
this uh, presentation has been recorded, so you can you can basically um, uh, review it slowly. <laughs> okay, I thank you once again, um, and obviously this won't stop here. We'll keep uh, we'll be creating a sort of community. We'll keep on assisting you. I mean, the objective here uh, it's not a. <laughs> Those who were present, this is not a workshop here. We've tried our best to, to give you some facilities, but basically we'll, we'll still keep in touch and can't continue to help you out. Um, I don't know if there are any final questions from the attendees here. I'm seeing a multimeter there, but uh, nothing was spoken about it. Nothing was said about it. Yeah, How basically a multimeter. Uh, it's it's an important tool into electronics. Uh, in this case, we didn't see the, the, the need to use it because all was uh, written on, on, on paper, but most, most of the times, and even in this case, you might need one. As you can see, and uh, Mike explained, in Storbio, we are, we are using resistors. Also, we are using also variable resistors over here. Potentiometers. Potentiometers. We have two, two different values of potentiometers. Visually, mm. you, you can't uh, distinguish. Di distinguish between the 500K and the 10K potentiometer. So basically, you can do that with a meter. But to help you out in the packages, I marked the 10K potentiometer with a black dot at the back so that it will distinguish itself on the potentiometer itself. It's not marked on the, it's marked on the potentiometer itself at the back. There's a black dot. Beauty spot. <laughs> like a beauty spot. Another thing about the circuit, which I would like to point out, is that C14 mm. is not included in the package. Uh, the circuit can do without it, and uh, it's like a decoupling capacitor for the IC. Power supply. The power supply of the IC, and uh, that was not included. That's the only component which was not included. So a few of you might have been looking for that component and didn't, fi didn't find it. Also, it's good to note, uh, how, it, how is the unit powered? So what sort of power supply is needed to, yes, to power Yes, that's it? another interesting question. And also how to connect it. I know it's basic, but some people might still, um, maybe uh, it's, it's, it's good to, to know that too. Okay, um, one, one particular uh, thing which I considered when designing the circuit was um, what sort of power supply would most people have? And uh, the, the, the answer I gave myself was, that most everybody have what, uh, what they connect to recharge the mobile phones, their mobile phones, so um, it could work by five volts. So if any of you can, you can, uh, if you have a charger, it could work from five volts. However, it can take uh, up to a battery of nine volts, the, the, the square one, the PP3 kind of uh, battery, which can be connected through here, or else uh, to a power supply, uh, the, the Americans call it a Walmart. You plug it in and you have like uh, 12 volts in it. And there is a socket, a power socket here, which is here. which is here, where you can connect the power supply straight into it. Um, it is good to note that the center of the pin should be the positive. So you have a choice of either buying a power supply, it's, it's very cheap, or else use a 9 volt battery, or else a fuel cell, I believe it's called, from which you charge this one on the go. So basically, that should cover most every person who would like to power this 
Me, I have a bench power supply, but uh, you know, uh, I'm a hobbyist, so I, I don't think everybody has that. So, you know. so any final questions? Well, thank you very much, and this wraps up the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, and on to our next activity, yes, Electronic Music Malta. Uh, and yes. Yeah. Do you have any other courses? I think. Uh, well, that's a very good question. Um, we've seeing all this interest. Definitely, we will we'll be organizing other activities, and maybe even assembling maritons. I mean, it's all, it's a workshop, just the same. But we will have more time to to maybe um, network together and obviously get get to grips with soldering and the basics of it. This is yes. just the beginning. Okay. Thank you very much, then. Good night and good evening to everyone and happy, new, happy Christmas and a happy new year and stay safe everyone. Thank you very much.